I love Christmas. I start celebrating Christmas July 5th, as soon as 4th of July is done. Uh, Christmas music is on. Our tree is up before Halloween. I'm shopping for presents uh, all year round. I'm down for all the Christmas traditions. I am down with Christmas. Christmas, probably for most people, is not all about Jesus. You know, a lot of it is about giving gifts and Santa and all these traditions that I enjoy with my uh, five kids. Uh, but my life is all about Jesus, and Christmas is all about Jesus. And there's so much of this that is redeemable. But how did we, as a culture, or maybe even individually, get to the place of Christmas being all about Santa? and uh, kind of this commercialism. So what I want to share with you today is about this man in red, Santa Claus, Saint Nick. And so if you could take a trip with me, let's look at the history of Santa and what actually inspired the real Santa to do the things that he did. <laughs> There's just no Christmas spirit anymore. Who's that you said? The name is Santa Claus. That is true. It's Santa Claus. And it's Elf. Oh, Christmas isn't just a day. It's a frame of mind. How can I do so much in just one night? All right, all right, all right, all right, everybody! Merry Christmas to all. Santa's coming to town. Santa! Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. Santa is certainly one of the, if not the most, popular person in the world. Probably because of all the movies that he's in. I don't know how, how he gets cast for all these movies, but he's in Elf and Miracle on 34th Street and Home Alone and Jingle All the Way and all these movies that there's a Christmas movie, I've probably seen it. Santa, also, his favorite drink is my favorite drink. Not hot chocolate, Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is probably second favorite behind coffee. But anyways, Coca-Cola took this thought of Santa, this gift giver, and apparently he was like wearing green or blue or who knows what he was wearing, but this red crusader that flies through the night and drops off presents for kids and lives in the North Pole with elves was marketed by Coca-Cola. Santa's also got probably the most popular and fashionable way to dress. I mean, you know, we've broken it down to like suits and sweaters, but this whole thing with the red cap and the white ball and the, you know, red suit going on, people are dressing like them all around the world. I remember the first time I saw Santa, in the mall, sat on his lap. I cried, you know, and I didn't get what I asked for too. So that was the, the insight for me. Uh, but all these people that are dressing up like Santa all around the world, and this has been going on for almost a couple hundred years, Salvation Army actually took the look of Santa to try to get uh, money for the poor, for their organizations, and so they had people ringing a bell, looking like Santa, and that way people were in the giving spirit and uh, giving to the Salvation Army. And Santa goes by a lot of aliases. You know, he's got Santa, Santa Claus, Kris Kringle, he's got Father Christmas, uh, Poppy Noel in Brazil, he's got uh, the Christ Child in uh, some European nations. But there's one group of people that have been celebrating this Saint Nick or what we know now as Santa Claus is the Dutch and they celebrated this on December 6th by dressing up like him and giving gifts to mainly their children and celebrating actually the day that Saint Nick died was December 6th and so they would get their presents on uh, December 5th and uh, the kids would come and open up their presents and they'd have a huge feast really celebrating this amazing man who actually lived and his name was Saint Nick, and he was the Bishop of Myrna. So who is the real Santa Claus? Well, he was actually a really amazing guy. He was born in Turkey uh, around 270 AD, 
and uh, his parents were Christians. And this was during a time of great persecution, especially in that region. And uh, we're not sure how his parents died. His parents were extremely wealthy. And by the time that he became a young man, he gave away his entire inheritance to the poor, the needy, and the sick. There's a few things that Santa Claus is known for. And one thing is there is a poor family uh, in there where he was doing ministry as the Bishop of Myrna or the pastor of Myrna. And this dad had three young daughters and he couldn't provide for them a dowry. And back in that day, you had to have, if you had a daughter, it's like paying for the wedding, you have a dowry that you would pay uh, to make sure that they are cared for if they got married. Well, he didn't have the money for that. And so he was actually having to sell them into prostitution or sell them as slaves, which eventually they would become prostitutes. And Saint Nick goes in the middle of the night and throws three bags of gold over the window into their house and it lands in their shoes. And that's where we got the idea of putting gifts in people's stockings. There also are a couple accounts later in his life as he traveled to Israel, the Holy Land, and came back that there was a crazy storm on the sea. The sailors were terrified. Does that sound familiar? Uh, well, Santa Claus, Saint Nick, says a prayer. And then also it says, tradition, that uh, the seas became calm. Saint Nick was known for being generous. And we actually have a few things that he said. And one of these things, quote, the giver of every good and perfect gift has called upon us to mimic his giving by grace through faith, and it is not of ourselves, end quote. Very similar to accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior there found in Ephesians chapter 2, but not just being saved by his grace, but also being generous by his grace is something that Saint Nick was known for. I think my favorite story about St. Nick is later in his life, towards the end of his life, uh, they had this thing called the Council of Nicaea. And that's where about three to 400 bishops or pastors uh, around the world came to this one place, Nicaea, and they talked about a couple things. We wanted, they wanted to write down what do Christians believe, and they also wanted to give uh, what books of the Bible should be in here. And so they canonized the 66 books of the Bible that we have today, and they also gave the Nicene Creed. It says this, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, I believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, the true God from true God, begotten, not made. It goes on to say, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who is spoken through the prophets. Well, Santa Claus actually didn't get to finish that entire meeting. He actually got arrested. And here's the reason why. And I love this. I had to see Santa strolling up on his sled with, you know, toys on his back and getting there to Nicene. And there was this guy, Arius, who was saying that Jesus isn't God and St. Nicholas couldn't hold it in anymore. And so he walked up and he slapped him in the face. And everyone's like, I can't believe Santa just slapped somebody, right? Uh, well, actually, you're not supposed to do that as a pastor either. And so they actually took off his bishop robe, probably took off his pointy hat, and they put him in chains and put him in a dungeon. And uh, But that really stuck with everybody to hold on to the fact that Jesus is God. There's a Trinitarian God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so not only was Santa a big time generous, giver, caring for orphans, widows, children, those that are poor, but also he held firm to the tenets of Christianity and helped form even the first time that we wrote out, here's what our Christian doctrine is, which is the Nicene Creed. Jesus Christ has always been the most famous person all around the world since the dawn of Christianity. 
And I know, you know, it ebbs and flows as far as a generation and a location of who Jesus is. And that does have to do with, you know, him being a cultural icon or a religious leader or how many movies he's in or TV shows he's in. But who is Jesus really? There's a wonderful quote that I love that gives a great description of what Jesus has done here on this earth. Philip Schaeff says this, quote, Jesus of Nazareth without money and arms, conquered more millions than any leader, without science and learning, shed more light on things human and divine than all philosophers and scholars combined. Without the eloquence of school, he spoke such words of life that were never spoken before or since, and produced more effects which lie beyond the reach of orator or poet. Without writing a single line, he has set more pens in motion and furnished themes of more sermons, discussions, learned volumes, works of art, songs of praise than a whole army of great men of ancient and modern times." End quote. So why is Jesus the most important person in history? Well, what was the world like before Jesus got here? See, Romans 1 says that everybody knows that there's a God because of creation. And then Romans 2 says everyone knows there's a God because of our conscience. And so the whole world is looking for God. And also the whole world is looking for a Savior back thousands of years ago and also even today. And so the Jewish people had this person. They called him the Messiah. It's kind of like a Jewish superhero. And from the dawn of creation, from Adam and Eve, there was the first prophecy of this Messiah as God said, hey, Adam, you're gonna work hard, it's gonna be difficult because you sinned, and Eve, you're gonna give birth, but there will be one man that's born of a virgin, the seed of a woman, and he will crush the head of Satan, but bruise his heel. In that prophecy of Genesis chapter three, verse 15, there's the virgin birth, the death of Jesus, and the resurrection. The whole Bible, all 66 books, point to Jesus. The Old Testament points forward to Jesus. The New Testament points back to Jesus. And so Jesus comes on the scene. Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies that were foretold throughout the Old Testament. There's 456 of these prophecies. He fulfilled 316 in his lifetime. He's, he's alive, spoiler. Uh, and he's gonna come back and fulfill 140 more just to fulfill eight of them. And the way that they got this is the probability with how many people were living on earth in that area. And they came up with these eight prophecies. If you were to fulfill these eight, it would be 10 to the 17th power. That's like filling up Texas with silver dollars and putting an X on one of them. And you have one chance to pick up the one that has an X on it. All the prophecies foretold about this superhero uh, that's gonna come and save the world, the Messiah. He was born, and you know the story, born of a virgin. There, you know, rejected, wasn't allowed to come into the inn, born really in a cave with animals, put into a, essentially a dog dish, a manger, wrapped in rags and angels singing, the glory of God coming down. And the shepherds, the least likely people to say, you know, to be trusted, they carried the message that Jesus was born, that God became a man. And as Jesus lived here on earth, the Bible says that he was tempted in every way, yet without sin. And he was a worker of miracles. He did calm the seas when the storm was raging with just one word. He did feed the hungry. He did free the prisoners. He did raise up little children and gave them back to their mothers after they died. Jesus is the greatest man who's ever lived. Jesus, his life should be emulated, but also he is the perfect sacrifice. You see, Christmas is about God becoming a man, Jesus being born, but the reason that he was born was to die. And truly the man in red is Jesus Christ, the giver of gifts. What Jesus gave was his life. And there he lived the perfect life and he died the sacrificial death on the day of Passover. He was abandoned by all of his friends. He was uh, betrayed by one of his friends. He was denied by one of his best friends. He was put on a legal trial. The reason that actually he was accused to death 
and suffered death was blasphemy because he claimed to be God. And then he was mocked and they placed a crown of thorns on his head and he began to bleed as they punched him in the face and then blood covered his whole body as the cat of nine tails went around his whole body 39 times to take off the flesh off his body. And then he was pinned up on a cross and there the man in red on the cross died for you and me. And before he died, he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And he said the Hebrew word to Talistai, which means paid in full, that if you believe in Jesus Christ, that all of the sins that you've committed, he's died for. There's a wonderful description of Jesus' life and who he is uh, in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 through 8. It reads, Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to God the Father and to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You see, Jesus Christ is not a mere man. Jesus Christ is the God-man. And as the Bible says, Jesus loves you, this I know, just like we read. The Bible tells me so, that he loves you so much that he would die for your sins. And then him pinned up on the cross in red with his own blood, washed away your own sins. And so if, the Bible says, if you believe that, in your heart, you confess that with your mouth, you shall be saved. And Jesus didn't just die on a cross. Many have died for others, but Jesus rose from the dead. And in fact, uh, Jesus wrote a letter to the church that Santa pastored. It, we know it as Myrna, but in Revelation chapter two, he says to the angel or the pastor of the church in Smyrna or Myrna, right? These are the words of him who is the first and the last who died and came back to life again. You see, just like St. Nick, something that was important that we believe as Christians is Jesus is God, that he's not just a man, that he died for our sins, yes, but he rose from the dead and he has given us that power. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and me. Jesus is alive. And he was alive in St. Nicholas and other Christians that have lived for the last 2,000 years. He's alive in me. The question is, is he alive in you? And again, Christmas, love the traditions, love the movies, love the season, but it truly is all about Jesus. And fortunately or unfortunately, Santa, St. Nick, isn't looking to see if you're naughty or nice, isn't checking a list uh, twice. <laughs> But Jesus is. Jesus sees everything. And not only the things that you do, but the things that you think, things that are in your heart. And Jesus died for your sin. Anytime you lied, anytime you stole, anytime you lusted or were greedy, Jesus died for that sin. And that's why we celebrate Christmas. The man in red that died for my sin, that died for your sin. And the word Advent, maybe you've heard that float around here during Christmas time. It means coming. And the advent of God, the first coming, was humble and meek and kind and willing to die, willing to let his creation kill him. But the second coming is Jesus coming back for his church and judging the world. What would Santa say to you and me today about Jesus' coming, his first coming and his second coming? Well, actually, we have some recorded words from St. Nicholas, the Bishop of Myrna, and it reads this. Children, I beseech you to correct your hearts and thoughts so that you may be pleasing to God. Consider that although we may reckon ourselves to be righteous and frequently succeed in deceiving men, we can conceal nothing from God. Let us therefore strive to preserve the holiness of our souls and guard the purity of our bodies with all fervor. Ye are the temple of God, says the divine apostle Paul. If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. Pretty heavy quote. 
But we can act religious. We can go to church on Christmas. I'm choosing not to. I want to be with my family. But there's things within my heart and mind that only God sees, that I can put on a show, you can put on a show, that everything's okay, that we're right with God, but God truly knows. And Santa Claus is encouraging us to strive towards holiness, and holiness really only comes when you come to the cross and you ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin, and you ask the Holy Spirit to come inside of your life and give you that power in every place within your life to make Jesus the center, to make Jesus everything, not just on Christmas, not just on Easter, but every day and every moment. And so let's be more like the man in red. Yes, Santa Claus, Saint Nick, wonderful guy, did a lot of great things, but his motivation was Jesus Christ. And he is the true man in red that we celebrate today. Merry Christmas. <laughs>